What's up guys, I'm Jamie with Property Bear and I'm going to give you some advanced strategies on getting your offers accepted in multiple offer situation. If you want basic strategies, you can just look up on Instagram, Realtors of Instagram, and there's a ton of templated content out there um, with lifestyle shots of like the basics, like escalatory clauses, love letters, um, strong pre-approvals, right? Um, but this is from an advanced standpoint and from a seller's perspective because we are sellers of some of these properties. So check it out. I'm Jamie Tejera, co-owner of Property Bear here in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Carrie Hustis, co-owner and sales leader. While Carrie runs all things sales, my day-to-day -day hunting investments and developments keeps me in two main places. In the field, checking out potential opportunities in construction or on the computer researching hyperlocal data. So if you're looking for insight on Jacksonville real estate, you've come to the right place. Thanks for checking out our channel. And if you like it, please be sure to subscribe. All right, so first of all, why, you know, why we're making this video, why our perspective kind of matters, we are sellers of properties. So if I sell one house, right, right now, let's say we're seeing an average of four offers per house, you know, I'm looking at four offers per property that that we're selling and you know you're probably saying well you're a licensed agent right well yes but we're also sellers so our business um, most of our business is developer builder investor and our own personal sales that we're selling throughout the year so let's say we do a minimum of a hundred sales not working on the buy side working on the sell side um, on the you know through our Keller Williams team we're looking at an average of 400 offers a year right so whether we're looking at it from a seller perspective or an agent perspective you know we're kind of looking at it the same we have an ethical obligation to let our customers know hey this is what we would do right so somewhere between 25 and 50 of our of our selling of our listings per year are our own where we're the sellers on it so we are looking at it the same way you are we're not selling you know one house every seven years right? Whatever the normal cycle is, like we're doing it pretty consistently. So we're able to see a lot of fluctuations in the market and what's going on. But, and that's why, that's why you guys like us. However, here are, I guess, let's go over three strategies that are advanced on, you know, what makes a strong offer from a seller, you know, from my perspective as a seller and uh, my perspective from like the Keller Williams realtor standpoint. So number one is the realtor, broker, lender combo, right? You know, we, they, they always say like who you who you surround yourself with matters and like all that kind of stuff. That's kind of, you know, the, the platitudes. Um, the thing is it's, it's real from an offer standpoint. If I get offers from certain agents, brokerages and lenders, you know, if, if I've got three or four offers, I'm, I, there are certain ones I'm not leaning towards and that's just the reality. Um, from an agent standpoint, you know, when you have the experience on the as a seller and as helping a lot of customers sell homes, you know which agents flake out. Um, that's just the reality. You, we have a kind of fiduciary responsibility to let our sellers know, you know, and ourselves because we're the sellers on on a lot of them. Hey, this agent's kind of flaky or has flaked on a few deals in the past. I just wanted to let you know, you know, set the right expectations. You have to um, brokerage. You know, the, the brokerage part of that. Um, there's a lot of discount brokerages out there and I don't mean discounted commission brokerages. I mean like no fee to agent brokerages. They offer low service to the agent. Um, great for part time agents, all that stuff. The, the thing is, is that usually, you know, statistically they have the most broker issues um, and like contract issues, right? Where brokers have to get involved and there's mitigation and stuff like that. It's not a, it, it's not a dig against them. It's, it's, it's just pure statistics. Um, they tend to have more issues with that, right? Because when you're when you don't have the revenue to fund that training and stuff, you're going to have more problems. Um, and it is what it is. A lot of agents are are you know attracted to that kind of like loose loose fitting kind of brokerage. Um, and then the third part is the lender, right? If I'm looking at an offer and I've got a lender that I've never heard of, and I've got another lender that you know is one of the big players in the market, the truth is is that I know that. You know, I, I know which ones are Instagram stars and which ones are real, like real good lenders, right? And sometimes they're both, it's not often the case, but I know which guys are doing their homework um, on the customer, on the borrower first, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna be able to get this through so that 
my property is not tied up for 20 days and then they say, hey, my loan got denied, right? And we, on the, on the Keller Williams like agent side, we owe that duty to, the, to our sellers too, right? That's not an unethical comment. Um, we owe that duty to say, hey, we're not really sure about this lender, just letting you know, you know, if, if I were selling this house, I, w I like this one because I know this guy does his homework. Not to say this one doesn't, I've just never seen it before, right? And that is a risk when you're getting, when you're new into a business, that's part of the business. Second strategy is a big deal. Experienced agents, the ones that we like buying our properties that we know, and you know, in our listings, know this. And it doesn't get talked about enough, but mind net to seller, right? Sometimes we get some criticism with our hedge fund deals because you know, we're selling a customer's house or even our own to a hedge fund. And they're like, yeah, but the gross price that it sold for was less, but the customer netted more money because the way the closing costs work out um, and the commissions nets the customer more money in their pocket, right? And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. A lot of times, and we see it happen all the time, you know, th there's a better scenario, right? People are so focused on like the gross sales price and they totally forget about what actually gets sent to their bank account. As sellers, right, um, on some of our properties, like we're very aware of that. That's all, all we care about. Um, not all we care about, there's, I'm not gonna say love letters don't work um, because it's definitely pulled on some heartstrings before, um, but net to seller, pay attention to that. Don't, you know, don't disregard that. It's super important. How can you deal with that, right? And why does it help? Let's say I've got a $500,000 house, right? This literally just happened. And you've got, and two, two agents offered this out of the four, right? And I'm like, you guys are smart. You know what you're doing. They offered to pay the seller's closing costs, which is about 2%. Two biggest expenses to a seller when selling are commissions and closing costs, right? About 2% of it is that closing cost, the title fees. And I know that as a buyer, you're, you're paying 3%, lender, whatever all that stuff is. Um, but, so $500,000 house, and let's say we know for a fact it's gonna appraise at 500,000, right? But it's kind of risky if I, you know, if we offer 510 with no appraisal gap, we'll go over that in a little bit, it might not appraise, right? Well, if I offer 500 and I'm paying all the closing costs, it's pretty much the same as a 508 or 510 offer without the risk of the appraisal coming in low. So, that's one way to kind of get around it. And the appraisers are looking at the contract saying 500, you know, 510, whatever the number is. Okay, this makes sense, right? Um, in Northeast Florida, the seller's usually paying all of that 2%. In other markets, it, I, I understand that it's different. Um, on builder contracts, usually the buyer's paying all the closing costs, um, unless there's an incentive where the, um, where the builder's paying for part of the closing costs. Traditionally, builder is paying nothing. Um, so strategy, strategies, the third section, is removing contingencies or contingencies for contingencies, right? Um, remove inspection periods if you want. Um, let the seller's agents know up front, right? Like, th and this applies to you if you're an agent or a buyer, like tell your agent to do this, or if you're an agent, like learn from this newer agent. Um, let the sellers know if you're willing to agree to it, right? Hey. We wanna do an inspection, we wanna have an inspection period, but we're not going to ask for any repairs, right? We may ask for credits, um, but we're not gonna ask the seller to actually do anything because it's really hard to get like people to, you know, come out, labor, you know, labor force is low, all, all of those problems. Um, and the thing is, is that if you're buying a house, wouldn't you rather be in control of those repairs, right? Than putting it in someone else's hands? That's always been my thought, but um, you know, everybody's a little different. Um, so another, you know, contingency contingency is an appraisal gap coverage. Hey, I'm going to offer you 510,000, right? And I will cover up to $10,000 if it doesn't appraise, right? So let's say the house appraises for 500 and you've got a $10,000 appraisal gap with a sales price of 510, seller still getting their number, right? If you do an appraisal gap and the closing cost coverage, you're crushing it. Um, house comes in at 505, seller may not be netting that whole, or, or let's say the appraisal comes in at 495, right? Seller may not be getting that 510, but they know the appraisal number and they're still getting over what that number is. So it's a win, win, win. Um, 
anywhere you can remove contingencies, obviously cash is king. There's a whole bunch of uh, um, products out there, but I would, as far as like turning a non-cash buyer into a cash buyer, there's Homeward, there's Knock, there's um, Ribbon. Pay attention to the fees, they're all different. They, you know, when you get emotional about buying a house, you're like, I'll do whatever it takes, get me in the house. Um, make sure you're looking at those fees because you don't want to look on the back end and be like, holy cow, what did I just pay for? So hopefully these advanced strategies help you, whether you're an agent or a buyer, um, and good luck on your home search. And um, if you like one of our listings, let us know. We'll hook you up with, uh, with one of our buyer's agents and get you guys hunting. Have a good one.